here in this session. The original title was changed to, but this is what you see. Uh, an interdisciplinary critique of contending theories of culture. Three people worked on this, uh, one of them being me, I'm with uh, NIU. And then you have Shelley, Michelle uh, Dutka. She organized one of the Midwest conferences, Ball State University. And uh, this sparked my interest to work with her because she presented a paper. In fact, we're critiquing the framework that she used. Uh, for her paper, and uh, she was on board, very happy to do so. Because everyone uses that framework, we'll go into that later, in business and human resource development. And Dr. Jim Berger, he also organized a Midwest conference in Western Kentucky University. And also I attended one of his sessions also on culture. And uh, he talked about uh, salad or buffet. So the metaphor we use, I, we use here is smorgasbord. <laughs> so change the metaphor from one to the other. So the three of us were coming back and forth working on this paper and looking at the literature. Okay, now please introduce yourselves and say why are you here? Are you just stuck because there's nothing else to do? <laughs> and, and, uh, what is your idea of culture? What's your definition of culture? Maybe you could start counterclockwise. Okay, uh, yeah. I'm Sandra Bowles, and yeah. I'm attending this. It was a, I'm interested in uh, how culture interacts both in education and just in the, the work settings. Oh, okay. And my idea of culture can be um, it can be as broad as someone from another country, okay. another faith, another uh, region of this country. Faith, a regional country, or another country, or, an, or another region, of or this another country, region, like, like people, you know, in the southern region versus the north and okay. their experiences, right. and, and uh, so I'm um, just here. What you got to say? Okay. Okay. Uh, Shelley and Jim and I. Paulette <laughs> <laughs> uh, Isaac Savage, um, faculty at the University of Missouri St. Louis, and to be candid and honest, one of the reasons I came was. But as I think of culture, uh, it's such a broad, for me, it's such, such a broad term with that, um, broad definition can be associated with that, because I think of customs, I think of values, I think of rituals that people have, and certainly, uh, you know, it's time to what you said, uh, people, uh, people from different regions, so it's just so, so broad as I think of culture, it's really hard just to pin it down. Yeah, pin it down. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Jesse Bond, Cleveland State University, uh, doctoral student. Um, I'm really interested in cultures and lines with my research interests, and I say that it is the framework in which we define ourselves and others. Okay. okay. That's a response. <laughs> 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 Thanks. I appreciate it. <laughs> And my name is Lindsay Eppels. I'm a graduate student here at the university. Um, I also am a coordinator for the Office of Diversity and Inclusion here. Um, and the reason that I'm interested in this is we're constantly working with people um, of different cultures that might not realize that they are from different cultures because they don't define that. Um, I define culture, um, a lot of people get confused with race or ethnicity, but I define culture, uh, how you identify yourself as a specific group. Um, so. I'm here just to learn. Oh, thank you. Hi, I'm Clara Deacon Baltham. Um, I'm in this session because I'm actually very interested in the culture part of it. I work in the academic advising office for undergrad, and okay. we deal with a large population of international students, and I see a big disconnect between some of our American students and our international students and how maybe they don't understand each other's culture um, as far as understanding where they came from, which brings to what my definition is, and that is basically you're a product of your environment and your life experiences and other people have to have to understand that to understand you. Thank you. Please. Hi, I'm Kalpana Dukta and I'm actually adjunct faculty here at UCO um, for the for leadership um, and also adjunct faculty for Regis University uh, in their adult learning training and development uh, back in Denver. Um, and um, I think in today's world, um, you 
know, we can't we can't go a day without um, addressing culture and um, uh, or ignoring it for that matter. Um, and my definition of culture and actually my um, this was a, a big piece of um, my doctoral study. Um, which I finished yet. <laughs> and, um, inclusion. What's that? On inclusion, inclusion. Yeah. right? And uh, you know, you start out by defining culture, and it is more than just ethnicity and um, and religion and, and those things. And, and everything that's been stated so far is is a piece of it. Um, and it is about just like you said, a product of your environment, but also um, brings it so deeply embedded of, of your core being um, and and. Um, it can be defined, again, just in the group setting that you're in. Every classroom has its own culture, for that matter. Thank you. I'm Neil Curzon, Northern Illinois University. I'm with Ray all the time, so. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Second Doctor. Yeah. Oh my God. And yeah. the second master's at the same time. Yeah, I'm, I'm finishing. Yeah, I'll finish. Uh, <laughs> 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 you have to clean the house. Master. I'll finish the master's degree in instructional technology this fall. So I'm preparing my portfolio right now. And I am here because I'm interested in culture. And for me, culture, real culture, is the culture which is influenced by other cultures. It should not be rigid. Otherwise, it's going to be broken. So it should be influenced by others in order to survive. So. Thank you. And for that, yeah, please. Oh, I'm Teresa Allen. Um, I'm attending. This is the awardee. Oh, congratulations. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> Some research is done. For example, you know why in Africa, sub saharan Africa, people wear bright clothes? The research showed that it's not the natural, it's not the indigenous culture. It was the Dutch who occupied Indonesia, brought the patterns, and then mass produced them, brought them back to Africa. Because that's the exoticized, orientalized view of Africa, and they were sent. To Africa, sub saharan Africa, and it became part of many traditional cultures. But of course, in South Asia and Southeast Asia, there's a lot of exchange and linkages that's more indigenously without the Western colonizer coming into the picture. Okay, that's one thing. And secondly, the patterns, many of the patterns are taken from indigenous cultures. It could be South Asia, it could be Southeast Asia could be anywhere in the world, uh, in Latin America. They were brought to England with a spinning jenny, they copied the patterns, and there they were sold all over, and some of them went back to the indigenous cult. Many I would be shocked to see in uh, Kmart where this is an indigenous pattern, why is it? It's not mass produced. That's intellectual property stolen from the people. Yeah. If you look at it my way, it's, and then every time people from those cultures would do other, they say that's theft. 
But there's that coming the other way too, since colonial times. Okay, and then the beams. It used to be stones and shells. If you're from like Tibet, where there's no ocean, precious, semi-precious stones would be seashell. You don't get seashell in Tibet. So they, they mean a lot. If you have a seashell, a mother pearl, you are somebody. The same in some indigenous cultures far up in the mountains. And then some semi-precious stones they find everywhere. Okay, they will be, but now it's plastic. You are right. But then they keep what it was traditionally. They have garnet, amethyst, turquoise, whatever. Then the cell phone. <laughs> this really destroys, it gives you an aha moment, right? A zen moment, like, what's going on? So this is really one way of looking at culture. People living, behaving, acting, and the material objects. <coughs> and you have everything going on at the same time. So that was just other comments on the Zen moment here? I just, yeah. you know, I, I have so many things about this photo, but yeah. the one thing that sticks out to me is confusion as far as <coughs> why do they need those cell phones? Because how are they still, how has their society and their interaction with each other changed to where they need those if they're still living in a tribal environment? So what is the need for those phones? I heard the same question in Bangladesh. You have Mohammed Yunus helping the poorest of the poor, they're usually women who are widow, Grameen Bank, Nobel Prize, he's doing a lot of good. But then one of the projects is selling cell phones to village women. I never asked him, of course, who am I to ask Mohammed Yunus? But then it, it's in my mind to like, is that the priority needs of the village women in Bangladesh? But what, are, so, what are they using them for? I don't know. They are engaged in business, microfinance, so they sell little things here and there. But I don't know about the Kalahari tribe and so on. But yeah, but for Bangladesh, I have the same question. Can they call 911? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's one thing. Yeah. Uh, Larry, you want to introduce yourself and why are you here? Are all of these, are all of these tribes on electricity to power these devices? I mean, is that, are they just using them to power these to their roots? Or? Cell phones, Nokia was from Finland, Motorola, US, you know, Samsung, Korea. They're not native. They're all no, I mean, how are they powering them, though? I mean, oh. Do they have electricity in their own society? You know, so where in, they some, those? in some places, it's really bad. You know that you're digging deeper. We're not going to surface culture. We're going to deeper culture. This is one place, and then we'll go to Larry, uh, where you have people with the indigenous cultures, it, and sad to say, sometimes it's like a human zoo. And then outside, there's electricity and everything. And then some tourists are bad enough, they don't have to take photos like you do. You will have a snippet of, oops, there's just the woman, whatever it is, the 7-Eleven right beside the tribe. <laughs> it's really a human zoo in some places. It's, it's awful. Larry, why are you here? Everyone is to this opinion on you. Uh, to, to learn. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the and sage has spoken. Yeah. 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 I, I think cultures are almost self-imposed uh, meaning-making systems for groups of uh, people that's uh, fairly closely aligned. Okay. And so belief systems, uh, mores, uh, behaviors, expectations, and um, we sort of um, coalesce around those core values and perspectives. Thank you. It's good, right? If we put all of them together, we have, can collaborate and co-author a paper for, I'm serious. Yes. Next, Midwest, yeah, mm -hmm. and critique of the different lines. This paper is a product of people critiquing each other. Okay, so that was just an intro. <laughs> okay, so some problems that we see. Number one, culture is very important. We use it a lot in adult and higher ed, especially because we have the mandate in our schools and the workforce for inclusion and diversity. Oh yeah, that's your town. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's your town. <laughs> How can we miss it when we drive from Illinois to here? <laughs> okay, but the problem is many people just throw the word culture without defining what it is, okay, in many papers. And uh, it's very hard to generalize, and sometimes people wrongly use 
things like sex, age, color, and ethnicity as culture. As such, they are not culture as such. But each ethnicity can have its own culture. Okay, that's a difference. And instead of assuming there's one definition, in fact, there's a debate. This is the biggest issue. Uh, many human resource development, human resource management, business school, and adult ed literature love Hofstede. Okay, he did a study of, I think, about 66 countries of people working with IBM and trying to come up with what is the common trend in each culture, defined as national uh, characteristic. That's his uh, definition in each country. The problem is he came up with a binary type of culture. And Shelley, who wrote the paper, used this framework, and now we're critiquing this framework of Hofstede. Uh, we're saying, this is like, you're assuming there are two types of culture, and they're there for all eternity, amen. That's our critique, like, I don't think so. We don't think so. Not culture is not for all eternity, and it's a human, uh, meaning making, it's behavior, so behavior changes, meaning making changes, okay? And it's not immutable, rather, there's a lot of transformation going on. So that's one problem. This is a very famous framework. If you go be a consultant in, like Motorola, uh, Illinois often asks me, there's gonna be expat family going to Singapore, for Southeast Asia, it's oftentimes Singapore. Give them cultural analysis of Asia. Then I said, what framework do you use? This is what they use. Uh, uh, this is Bennett, and Bennett wrote uh, also a book on intercultural understanding. And then secondly, we assume it's really, a, a, there's two structures, like the Western culture, for example, and the non-Western culture. Okay, Edward Said, the Palestinian Christian, wrote something about this too. Uh, the assumption, we could call it uh, Orientalism. There's the Western culture, and then there's the Oriental culture. Okay, Oriental meaning North Africa, what we call as Middle East, and the reservation is called Oriental. Uh, in the British literature, British uh, colonial history, that's what they call as Oriental. And it's a critique, like now, you don't put North Africa, what we call as Middle East, South Asia, East Asia, Southeast Asia as one. They're not the same. Right, Kalpana or, <laughs> right, Aruni, is it the same? So that's a question. So we say, that's a big problem. We, we have to critique it. Rather, we use a post-structuralist. This gets even more confusing, dirtier. Because we're saying there's no structure. Okay, it's kind of free for all. If you want the PowerPoint, I can give you a link to it. Give me your email. You can get a copy of the PowerPoint. Okay, and it's not just one or the other, but it's really a plethora. It can go on and on, maybe at infinitum. Okay, so the question we're doing is, what's our critique of Hofstede's model? I give, gave you a glimpse. And then secondly, what are the alternative <laughs> definitions of culture? Okay. Second question, and then the third, so what's the implication for adult and higher education, for practitioners in the workforce, in the educational setting? Okay, so one, first part will be to describe the model briefly, and second, to give you the different definitions from the different fields. And thirdly, to show the implications for us in our field. Okay, so what do we do? So we looked at more than one dimension of culture. And we, we therefore categorized Jim Berger, um, uh, Shelley, and myself. The mainstream view is the Hofstein view, and the rest will be the alternative views. We're not saying one is better than the other. Again, we're showing you a whole spectrum okay, in all the different fields. Since in education, in human resource development, we rely on the other fields, right? We rely on psychology, sociology, politics, law, name it. So we'll go back to them. Okay, so we look for the keyword culture because we're looking for definition, very simple. 
And then we look at the latest textbooks, and we found that one textbook is even dated as 2013, even if we're still 2012, because that's how the publishers do it. So you'd see, is this an error in your, I think it's our first uh, book on the references. It's not an error, it's 1213, okay, one of them. So we look at the latest textbooks and uh, in business that we can get hold of, so it's not random, okay? Uh, like what Northern teaches, so we ask faculty to lend us their textbooks, and then we looked at the index culture when it appeared, and then went to the text as to how they define the word culture. So we went, uh, and then some texts appear again and again and again, like Gertz, Clifford Gertz. Uh, uh, so we, that's considered seminal work and definition of culture and, and others. Hofstede is another seminal work. Okay, so we put them together and categorize them. Anyway, the definition originally meant using your hand to cultivate, which means anything that you cultivate with your hand is not natural. Anything. A tree that grows on its own is natural, but if I plant a tree, it's cultural already, bitch. It's the same tree, but if I plant it for my happiness, to give me shade, that's not natural, that's cultural. Okay, that's the original uh, mid-15th century. But Levi-Strauss, a French anthropologist, uh, a structural anthropologist said, everything that's not natural is cultural. So in line with that definition, everything that you said, they're all uh, culture by this definition. Kant was the one who first used in the uh, modern period, Immanuel Kant, German idealist philosopher. The word culture with a K, in, I don't read German, but that's how he wrote it, which means civilization. And then Klan was the first one to use it in an anthropological sense, which means the studying of people and how they live, they eat the things that they produce, belief system, the music, and so on. Tyler is another uh, seminal work. He has written seminal work. All of these that you've mentioned earlier, okay, even law is considered culture because we made it up. Uh, because in nature, who says you should have I'm not shocking you, or this is not my belief system. Who says that you have to be monogamous? I'm not saying I'm, I'm <laughs> polygamous, I'm not. I'm just saying, we made the laws. Okay, so that's cultural. Again, I'm not polygamous. <laughs> just <laughs> clear. Okay, and then another anthropology book says these are the elements of culture. Or can you go back to that? Yeah. So, one, material products could be computer, the same way as we consider guitar culture. They're all human made. <coughs> so in this sense, it's larger, okay? And realm of the brain, linguistics, and thought, okay, philosophy. There's tons of this, so I will just fly through that. And then the critique will come. And then Kodak, it's one of the often used textbooks for Northern Illinois University Anthro 101 class. So uh, we looked at it and it says it's, okay, culture changes by its definition. This is a basic 101 textbook. And this is not natural. We learn to behave one way or the other. Now, <clears throat> And this is even, it goes even further. I think somebody, or at least two mentioned uh, thinking, feeling, and acting. Okay, this is where John Dirks will come in, the feeling part. Okay, so that's also considered. Ember, Ember, and Perry Green is also another book that, aside from Kotak, that NIU uses for undergraduate classes. I think several things. Uh, the same as in the past, except there's addition of uh, gender role. Okay. So this is an added attraction. Now, Williams is more of a, a 
shall I say, radical writer, and he says there are four ways by which we can look at culture. Okay, one is the creative part, the second is the way we live, or the third one is just specified theater, the common things that we consider as culture. And then the last is the reproduction of a given order. Like we assume that we're in, we're in society, children have to go to school, we should get a job, and we should get married, and we should, and so on and so forth, have a car, you know, have a house. So we uh, reproduce this, and our kids are expected to do the same. In a case in the US uh, way of life. Now, uh, the dominant discourse that we're critiquing is used in many fields. Okay, I mentioned this earlier already, hosting. It's very popular and for consulting with multinational corporations when their bosses, mid-level and high-level, will go abroad to, to live there and work there. They want to know how to behave properly. Okay, they would say, for example, how do we know if we should give gifts? Isn't that bribery? So you would lay ground rule, just like in Illinois where we're required to take uh, ethics tests. If it's below $100, it's a gift. It's $100 and dollar and one cent, one penny, that's already bribery. So there, there's a distinction. So in many cultures, you are expected to exchange gifts. And many more people from the U.S. say, why should I do that? I say, Be because it's expected that you do that. Okay, so that, that's for example. So that's what they would teach, right, in house. This is his main framework, right, in, in one table. Okay, so there are two cultures, the individualistic culture, the collectivist. Some culture, you know, we, we, just, we compete. Okay, I for myself, I will not teach you, I will not help you. In other cultures, we help each other. The problem arises when, in other cultures, when you help one another do homework, that's not cheating. You're helping one another. But in some cultures, that's cheating. Okay? And then in some cultures, you have to say, like, uh, Gandhi G. You have to respect. Uh, and there's so many equivalent in all different cultures. You don't just say, hi, Paulette. You have an added word. And when you, to respect, to show uh, hierarchy. And then in other cultures, when you say, this is half state's model, uh, that we're critiquing. Uh, I, Shall we go for dinner tonight? Do you want to? And let's say it would say to the people who accept uncertainty, I would say, yeah, but I really mean no, because it's rude for me to say no. I already know I'm not going. But you invited me, you, you think I'm going, because I said, yeah, I'm going. That's where disagreement happens. Like, you lied to me, you wasted my time. No, I was being polite, not to say no to you. That's where the misunderstanding happens. It happens in many cultures. <laughs> okay, that's, and then you have the masculinity, femininity, there's certain things that they expect you to do. Okay, to be like crying, for example. Men should not cry. Quote, unquote, right? So we're critiquing and say, okay, is that it? You assume all Americans are the same. You assume all French, American, German, Anglo-Saxon, Gaelic, Celtic, they're all the same? No, that's what we're saying. And that's not true. Okay, that, that's in detail that they gave. Okay, so, but his framework is very useful if you look 